Okay, so now we will talk about spatial data, spatial structures, data structures for uh, computer graphics. Essentially, we will discuss how to uh, organize our data in a scene for efficient processing. Uh, so, uh, and not just that actually, not just for the uh, organization and indexing, I will also uh, show these structures for shape representation. Okay, so I have two purposes here, let me be clear. These spatial structures with them, I will be uh, organizing my data in the scene for efficient processing, like for ray object intersection tests, I can make it faster. Uh, and addition to that, I will also use these, these structures to implicitly define a model, a 3D model to be used in my application. So I will start from that. Uh, so here is that structure, spatial structure called grid, regular grid. I will uh, utilize this structure uh, to define a shape implicitly like this uh, woman here. And the input point cloud would be this. So this is also a representation of this model, but uh, I can, uh, uh, so th th there is, uh, if when I embed this inside a grid, uh, the grid will implicitly define this model uh, and I can even extract a surface information from that grid. So I will go to this version. Uh, so what I mean is uh, the, uh, this algorithm, I want to emphasize here, uh, our grid cells are cubes, as I am talking about the regular grid. In 2D, they would be just squares, but here we will do 3D. Uh, so a grid like this, you start with the bounding box and of this object, and you make a grid out of that with uniform size cubes. Then you omit, discard the totally outside cubes. So they, I don't even uh, draw them here. Uh, and for the ones that are intersecting the object, we will be able to extract the surface pieces, the surface triangles, as we will see later. Uh, but again, as far as the structure goes, here this grid implicitly defines this bunny shape or this dragon shape, they don't necessarily have to be animals, of course. Uh, these models, they implicitly define it using the values on the grid vertices. Okay, so so how what are those values? Then these are in the most uh, popular case. They will be sine distance function. Uh, so for a given grid point key, I will I will define the sine distance function of this point to this input red so red point set. So how to define that distance sine version of it? So I will not just take the distance of key to this closest sample point O. Instead, I will look at the distance from key to the plane passing through O. So I will fit a tangent plane to these points that are close to O, okay, where O is the closest sample point to my current query point key. Uh, so there is a mechanism to fit a plane to a set of points using eigenvectors of the covariance matrix of these points, but this is not the issue here. Uh, I will then find the distance from G to this plane, assuming that this plane uh, approximates the local surface around O. So this distance I need, okay, from G to this uh, bl blue uh, location. So what is the length of this projection? If I get the dot product of this vector and 
the unit normal vector at this point, again, this normal comes with the tangent plane, it's the normal of that tangent plane. So it dot of this vector, g minus O, dot n will give me the length of the projection of g on in this direction. So it is the scalar projection of g in the direction of n. So if you shift this amount to left, you will be getting your distance, okay? Then your sign distance function is extremely simple actually. So it is a vector from O to G dot the normal vector unit, normal vector. And here is uh, show that dot product is that amount. If you shift this to here, then I will get my desired distance. So uh, attaching this value to every grid vertex, so it will lead to a, a positive value if G is outside, as you can see here. And if G is somewhere here, then the vector will be this and its projection will be negative. It will be to the odd other side of the normal. So it will be negative green for the inside uh, and it will be zero if it is exactly on the surface, as the name implies, the distance to surface is zero. So this grid here is implicitly defining my curve in 2D or my surface in 3D. Again, this regular structure, this spatial structure implicitly defines my, uh, my shape. So let's go further and get that shape from this implicit definition. How to do that? First of all, you discard uh, the cells that are uh, all outside, like all red, or all inside, like all green. They, they don't uh, carry information for me. I attack to these, to these, uh, hybrid cells, so I march through them. That, that's why we call this algorithm marking squares or marking cubes. I march through the hybrid uh, squares or cubes because hybrid means there is an action from outside to inside. So uh, in this configuration, for instance, if this is the uh, configuration, then since this is outside and this is inside, it implies that uh, there is a surface passing through this edge, okay? So I will, in particular, work on these edges that go from one color to another color. Okay, so in other words, from this cell, I will not be getting any surface out of these edges because it won't make any sense, right? It, it, it looks like this cell actually right here, if you zoom out. So I don't expect anything from inside to inside. And by the way, in 2D, the pieces you will get are going to be lines, lines. And in 3D, you will be getting linear triangles, again, linear surfaces. So let's go to 3D now. So I jump between 2D and 3D, but I hope that they are all clear. Uh, so in 3D, I have eight vertices in a given cell. So I may, I will have, uh, in out two options for eight cells, I have two to the eight configurations. Uh, but so this number, I will not use this many configurations actually. If you look carefully, uh, you will actually be using only 14 configurations, like two to the power of four minus two. 16 minus two is four. So I go from two to the eight to two to the four because I can reverse the red and green nodes, right? So if this is the configuration, then it will give this kind of patch here. If I reverse the red and green, so this is green and all others are red, then I will still be getting this topology, right? That's why I go from two to the eight to two to the four instantly. And I also get two, which are those two? 
these are those uniform cells. If all green, I skip it. If all red, I also skip it. So actually, what I have in my hand is just 14 configurations. Uh, then one last action in this uh, surface extraction from my spatial grid, spatial structure, is this interpolation. So if the current cell uh, hints for this kind of surface because of the hybrid edges here, the next question is where will I put my surface point on this hybrid edge or on this horizontal hybrid edge? Let's focus on the horizontal one. Will I just put it to the middle? No, don't do that. Uh, you can find a perfect location because if you look at this output here, they don't really always go through the middle, right? Actually, in this example, they kind of are, but unfortunately. Uh, so yeah, but they don't have to go through the middle. Yes, it is annoying that they all go. Ah, okay, so maybe here it is closer to the green, right? Anyway, so how can I find the exact black dot location? It is simple. Remember, I am looking for distance zero. The black or the black point that I will put on this edge, F will be zero. So it is given because I am hunting for F zero points. I also know the F value on the green and on the red grid uh, vertices. Again, it's a positive value, but, and it's a negative value. So what I can do is using all these F values, uh, positive, zero and negative, I can find this U parameter that will allow me to go on this edge, right? So essentially the F here is a, linear combination of fg0 and fg1 so how linear i will use this much fg0 and this much u much fg1 like if u is if i am somewhere here then u is very small so i will use a very small amount of fg1 and i will use a, a very big amount of fg0 right as expected so Again, let's wait it. I will wait FG0 with one minus U, whereas I will wait, wait uh, FG1 with just U. And now put zero here because I expect zero in my output. So it gives me a U value. Now what to do with this U value? You do your ray tracing, okay? Like your ray equation. Starting from this origin, which is a position, okay, G0, not FG0, but G0 itself, go in the direction of, <clears throat> from left to right, which is from G0 to G1, hence I use G1 minus G0 vector, and go U amount, where I already know the U from the previous discussion. So this will put you to the correct location on your uh, grid. <clears throat> now let's uh, talk more about these grids. So, so far we have dealt with only regular grids. The grid can also be adaptive. Uh, like uh, the parts of the grid that don't even have any object parts in it, then you don't have to actually focus on that grid as well. So you don't have to make high resolution of that grid uh, cell. So this has nothing to do with marking part, the surface representation, okay? There is, so now I am going through my indexing part, scene organization. So this kind of grid, grids, they will be used for uh, like ray object intersections. Yeah, so let's uh, like this. Uh, now we are at the second part of this class. We have already discussed the spatial structure for implicit definition of a surface. Now I am using spatial structures uh, for uh, scene organization, objects organization that will allow me fast processing. 
like in ray tracing. So if this is your ray, ray two, <clears throat> you will look at the triangles inside the intersected box on cells only. In this case, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight boxes will be tested, and that's it. So I may might have millions of triangles here. I won't even consider them because this ray can never reach them in the first place. <clears throat> so this adaptive grid actually has a special name called quad grid because if you uh, look carefully, so let me show how it has been generated. You start with this huge odd square, the bounding box, then you divide it into four pieces, okay? Like the way I draw here, one, two, three, four. So does the object intersect this box? Yes, then divide this into four more. Okay, like this. Does it intersect this cell? Yes, then make this cell even smaller, like divide it into four. Always divide into four, hence the quad name, okay, quad. And it also, we uh, store these cells in a tree structure, hence the quad tree name. Later on, so let's uh, focus on this cell. So this is the construction part. Uh, so does my own object intersect this cell? No, then don't even go and uh, subdivide it further. Just don't do it, stop it. And this will give you this adaptive grid where I have a set of cells of different sizes. By the way, this idea extends easily to 3D. In 3D, uh, given this box, the uniform division will give you eight equal boxes, four on top, four at bottom. Okay, so essentially you have eight boxes here and let's take the third box. I don't know, maybe it is this box, like zero, one, two, three, if you order it like this. Then if object intersects this box, make another eight out of it, hence, your oak tree. Uh, and now we can also uh, see this uh, with an example like this. Uh, so here is my object, as weird as it is. Uh, again, I will follow a certain rule, like I will go northwest, northeast, southeast, southwest. Okay, I will go clockwise order. So first, this is the global bounding box, the biggest cube outside. It intersects the object, obviously, there is some object in it. So it needs further decomposition. Uh, it leads to this northwest, and I paint it black because this part doesn't intersect anything, anything with the object. So it won't be processed further. Black means stop. But gray means uh, there is some object and some uh, background. So there is an intersection. And I will later, because of that intersection, I will later make another decomposition out of this cell, lead, giving me to uh, four new cells. Gray one, this one, black one, this one, which won't be processed further. Then comes this one. Again, I am following that clockwise order. Then comes the totally white one. Again, this white one will not be processed further either because this is completely occupying the object. Uh, yeah, that's it actually. This is the idea of a quad tree. Uh, the, now let's talk about alternatives to quad tree. Uh, here is binary space, space partitioning, BSP tree. Uh, one thing to notice is uh, the separation planes or lines are not axis aligned here. Okay, so 
it goes like this. So if this is your scene, uh, I start with the root, which covers all the objects in my scene. I have eight objects, by the way. Uh, and this root node actually divides the scene into two, left half and right half. For the left, I also divide it into two, top and bottom. But for implementation goals, you can also call them as left and right. And similarly for this, and I do it one more level. So you repeat this until the partition has a few uh, has few uh, pieces in it, okay, like one or two, whatever. So this is not axis aligned, uh, but a special case of BSP tree is called KD tree, k-dimensional tree that would be axis aligned. Uh, and KD tree is different than another axis aligned structure we discussed, namely quad tree or oak tree, because in a KD tree, every node has two children, okay? So because it is uh, a generalization of binary search tree, so we will always have two children. That will be even easier to handle than a quad tree, actually, as we will see now. Because in a quad tree, I can have up to four children or even eight if I am in 3D with an oak tree. So with KD, I have two children. So let's visualize the difference between them again. Uh, in a quad tree or oak tree, here is a quad tree. Uh, we split around the point. Okay, so given this point, we split it like into four pieces, one, two, three, four. Uh, and center of the subdivision of that node, uh, yeah, like center of subdivision. But in KD3, we split among a long dimension. So if you have three dimensions, we first split along X dimension, which gives you the uh, red vertical plane. Then we split around Y dimension, which gives you this green plane for the left of the red, and which gives you the second green plane for the right of the red. And then if I need further splitting, then I will use the next available dimension. If there is no new dimension, I roll back to the beginning of the, yeah, to the beginning for my first dimension. In this case, I have a third dimension called the Z dimension, and they give me the blue separators. And they separate it to like in terms of depth near far. But as far as the implementation goes, I will always have two pieces out of one piece, left and right, I call it. So let's talk about the construction of a KD tree then. So let's see the split along the next dimension idea. So seven two is my first point. Okay, it is here, seven two, the black point here. It splits the scene into left part, which will have these three dots and the right dot, which will have these two dots. So three dots, two dots. Then comes five four, which would be this guy. Now be careful, I will now, I am now at the second level. So I will use the Y coordinate to separate them, top and bottom. In other words, for the insertion of five and four, I will look at, I will compare five X dimension with seven X dimension. So five is less than seven, hence you put it to the left of it, like the binary search tree. Later on, when this uh, part is split, uh, I will look at the Y dimension, like data point three, I compare it with the four. So I look at the Y dimensions and three is less than four, so go to the left. Similarly, seven is bigger than four, so go to the right of this node. Notice that four, this four is smaller than five. So binary search tree logic must put this to the left of it, right? 
However, you need to be careful about the current dimension. For this uh, level, I will use the second dimension for the split, which is four versus seven. And hence you go to the right. So again, implementation wise, you always have left and right pieces. But for the visualization, you can see that this breaks the uh, space into left and right. Then this blue breaks the region into top and bottom. At top, I have four, seven. At bottom, I have two, three. Four, seven, two, three. Yeah, so there is a huge benefit of using a KD tree in ray tracing, for instance. Uh, this model of 70,000 triangles, without any KD tree around, like I test a given ray with all 70,000 triangles, it will take two hours to complete on a recent uh, regular laptop. But with a KD tree, I will be skipping a lot of triangles. Like in the end, on average, I will be testing array with five to 10 triangles or something. So I end up with two seconds. Yeah, so this uh, KD tree logic, uh, actually it gives you, uh, you can make bounding volumes in 3D uh, hierarchical, hierarchically in, in a hierarchy, hierarchy uh, you can keep them, then you have this bounding volume hierarchy, BV8. And for the last example of this class, I will go through an example uh, of a BVH uh, using KD3 of bounding boxes. So for a node in my tree, KD3, I will keep a box with me. Inside this box, I will have a set of triangles. Uh, but more importantly, for this node, I will have left and right, two other nodes. And uh, I will fill them in is, if necessary. So the way we proceed is like this. Start at the root, which contains all the triangles and the biggest bounding box surrounding the whole scene. As we go down in the tree, split on different, on the next dimension. X, Y, Z, and then again X, Y, Z, so on. For each level of the tree, uh, what we do is we uh, split that uh, node, that box, according to the current dimension. If it is an X dimension, then you will have a left and right split, etc. And with this way, you have a lot of boxes around in a hierarchy. And when do you stop doing that? You stop when uh, the box contains one or two or a very few amount of triangles in it. So let's see a 2D demo of that. Let's make a clear understanding. So this is your input. I am in 2D, so... Uh, I am talking about uh, areas, not volumes, but anyway. The, this node is my root. It represents the initial bounding box inside of which I have all the triangles, which are white here. Later on, I split it. It, it will give me two new nodes, red for the left and green for the right. Now, notice that in the black, I have this split based on X dimension, so left and right. Now take the red and take the midpoint for a balanced split, take the midpoint of the red triangles, which is this star, and make a split not on the X dimension, but on the Y dimension. So it will give you a top and bottom case, top light blue and bottom dark blue. And you also plug them into your tree here. Similarly, I do the same, uh, top of uh, the green box and bottom of the green box. Notice one thing, 
what do you notice? The boxes can be overlapping, right? No problem. You just observe this. Uh, and why it happens is because the here, based on this uh, split point star, <clears throat> all the triangles uh, above it are like that. Uh, and below it are like that on the pink. Huh, okay, this is the construction. Now let's see how it uh, helps me. How I can utilize this tree in my ray object intersection test that will bring my two hours execution time to just two seconds. Here is how. Uh, let's start with the orange ray. Okay, the simplest ray around. So intersect this with the root black node. It doesn't intersect, so don't go below it. And by not doing that, you essentially do nothing. You quit. So I just saved ray versus intersection of all these triangles here. Let's go with a, another ray, like the red ray. I think I talk about it at top here. Uh, so first, definitely, I will always test it with the root, so there is no escape from it. And if there is a hit, if there is an intersection with that box, then I go deep. Then I look at its two children. Remember, I, I have a KD tree here, here, so I have at most two children below me. So from the red child, uh, so the red box, I mean this box, I look at that box, notice that. However, I don't look further below red because my ray, red ray, doesn't intersect the red box. Unfortunate naming, but it is what it is. Uh, so red ray doesn't intersect the red box. So you prune down everything, prune out the whole subtree below red node, red box. Then I do the next node. So for the black, I tested red. Okay, done. Now test green. Yes, my red ray intersects the green box, which makes me travel below green. So I will investigate green further, which will make me look at yellow and pink as well. So this is the way we implement this and we plug this into our ray tracer for huge time benefit. And here I can also give you an implementation like uh, it is prone to errors, but it, uh, it goes like this. So given a uh, ray, and the starting bounding box, starting root node, the black node, will it return true or false? So if I have a left child available, like red, uh, or right available, so these are not empty, available, then I make it, make the intersection test recursively the same test, with the tree rooted at red and rooted at green. Okay, so I do these uh, recursive calls all the way down. When I reach a re leaf node where I don't have further below children, so this if will return false. So it means that I am now dealing with a triangle array that has few elements in it. So now I can make a for loop finally. So I look at all the triangles in that node uh, and I call my hit function. Again, ray versus triangle hit, we discussed this before. Uh, like you can use body-centric coordinates. Uh, it's the fastest way to make that test. Uh, and then you essentially return true. Like I have an intersection. Uh, but instead of returning a Boolean value, once you find the intersection, you can just as easily return the uh, time parameter, the closest hit location for the hit, closest hit location on the ray. Okay, so you can also represent uh, return that, but this is just a detail. 
Uh, okay then, what is happening here? Uh, KD3 example when I am in three dimensions, K is three. Uh, yeah, so these are the uh, bonding volumes around me. Uh, and this is the end, actually. Yes, uh, so yes, leave it at this point. Uh, and I can take your questions if you have any. Thank you.